और कोटा एडमिशन आई यू हैव टू गिव समन कोटा एडमिशन व्हेन देयर इज अ मैटर ऑफ लाइफ इन्वॉल्व मतलब वो वेन डायग्राम बनाए उसको घंटा मालूम है कुछ लाइफ में 35 लेके वो ऐसा पास किया है वो अजीब सी लैंग्वेज में बात कर रही थी से कोड़ू किट्टा किट्टे दीदी आप सुबह किससे बात कर रही थी और बोल रही थी कोड़ू किट्टा किट्टे कौन सी भाषा है ये इसका मतलब क्या है आपकी भाषा है इसका मतलब तो बताओ कोड़ू किट्टा किट्टे पता नहीं क्या बोल रही थी कि कौन सी भाषा है हम लोग की भाषा कहां की कहां मतलब क्या है इसका मतलब क्या है कोड़ू किट्टा किट्टे है क्या कर रही है कोड़ू किट्टा किट्टे मतलब नहीं क्या कर रही है इसी टाइम तो आई थी अच्छा तरह लगा दिए बिकॉज मैं YouTube में आने वाली हूँ और मैं अच्छा दिखना चाहती हूँ भंगी की तरह नहीं दिखना चाहती Why was Twitter so angry at Neville Shah's joke and was Neville's apology genuine or just damage control? Has cancel culture finally come for the poor, innocent, privileged yet powerless Indian stand-up industry? What other skeletons did Castaway Twitter dig in the days to come? In this video, you will find all that as well as answers to some tough questions about casteism. Caste and reservation are those touchy subjects in India that aggravate people tremendously. some for good and some for no reason at all when i decided to begin my talking head videos come back on my channel my initial goal was to start with something less polarizing like i don't know women's labor or current joy maybe but as i witnessed this whole caste fiasco unfold before my eyes on twitter i thought this is where we start Chapter 1 The Neville Shah Blunder Indian stand-up guy Neville Shah recently did a stand-up routine for Amazon a small clip from that show went viral as you can see Neville was mocking not just the doctor who was treating his mother now dead mother he was also mocking quota admissions for passing with a 35% marking This got the eyes of some cast aware people and Ritesh amplified it on Twitter with everything that was wrong with Neville Shah's jokes. And before anyone gets pissed off and gives that excuse that oh it's a joke it's supposed to offend and leave the comics alone blah blah blah. Let me quote the golden rule of the world's best stand up comedians to you. It says Your comedy is supposed to punch up not punch down. In other words, you're supposed to mock the powerful, not the powerless or the marginalized or minorities who are already facing oppression or stigma of one kind or another. Okay, so even as per comedic standards, this mocking of disabled people or quota doctors was unacceptable. But can we just agree these were bad jokes and move on? Well, not quite. You see, when enough people on Twitter got enraged about this, Neville Shah issues an apology, and here it is. privileged celebrity apology bingo the mention if i hurt someone when people are telling you outright that you did hurt us the mention of a dead mother or some other sympathy element in the mix which is absolutely unrelated to you being a jerk the mention of your clean intentions that nobody cares about what people do care about is the impact of your actions which they want you to take accountability for you can bomb a country and say oh my intentions were to give them democracy how ridiculous would that be imagine if that ever happened 
Chapter 2 The Hidden Castest Skeletons of Indian Celebrities While this Neville Shah event was unfolding, a lot of cold clips and tweets surfaced on Twitter from a lot of celebrities and other people in positions of power. The most shocking thing about it? These are mostly from people in the left-leaning side of politics. People who mock the right-wingers and claim to be social justice warriors. Who use all sorts of hashtags and stand up for BLM. People who refer to themselves as woke and progressive. People who say they want equality and justice. So many of these celebrities, and I love some and admire some, have such high impression that I could not believe my eyes what I was reading. So, I grabbed some of those for you for this video. Jacqueline Parisha from Feminism in India was also another shocking case. So was Shali Chopra from She the People. Both of these women are not so much of a celebrity but a well-known and well-respected feminist on social media. When all of this was brought to light, Jacqueline did issue an apology and this was met with this response. Gautam Gambhir said, Dr. Kwaria said, Someone called Mumbai Kirani said. Chapter 3. How did the stand-up comedy industry react to this event? Well, Kunal Kamra said. Daniel Fernandez said. Jeet Ganguly said Azim Banadwala had a slightly longer response but worth a look in completion so I have it here for you Azim said raised some good points there, which lead to the ultimate elephant in the room. Cancel culture. Chapter 4. Has cancel culture finally come for the Indian stand-up industry? Let's find out. Cancel culture is a touchy word because many people confuse cancel culture with accountability. And while we're at it, let's just put it outright. The stuff in this video isn't about political correctness either because this stuff is straight up casteist in nature. I don't care what politically correct language you use, but if your bigotry is showing, it is showing and we can see it right through you when you say it. But Anyway, let's factually analyze this Neville Shah episode from whatever information I could gather. Event 1. Neville's clip goes viral on Twitter. Event 2. People start shaming Neville on Twitter while also educating him why he was out of line. 
Event 3. Neville issues a half-baked run-of-the-mill celebrity apology, which we all know is less for the disabled and non-upper caste community, but more for his sponsors. Event 4. The print, quint, and few other media wrote pieces about these woke comedians making casteist, sexist, and Islamophobic jokes. Event 5. The cancellation. Ugh. Wait. I'm searching for the cancellation. Okay, still searching? Still searching. Well, were there any arrests? Nope. Was his sponsorship or shows cancelled? Nope. Not that anything showed. Was he physically confronted or attacked or abused? Nope. Did he lose clout? Hmm. Hard to say. But no, because the people who buy tickets to his shows are mostly privileged cast ignorant people themselves who rather enjoy this stuff as heard from the clip itself where people are laughing when he said those things. So I'm gonna take a guess and say no because he might have actually gained clout after making headlines because you know he's connected with Ogilvy India as well so powerful guy. Oh that reminds me did Ogilvy fire him? <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Nothing in the news. Okay, so how exactly did Neville get cancelled? Well, let me know in the comments if you find out. But since we are talking about cancel culture, let me give you some examples so you have a better idea of what cancel culture really is. Cancel culture is sitting on national life TV and claiming to behead an actress and a director for making a fictional movie. Cancel culture is Amir Khan's sponsorship taken away from him and he was being harassed, called anti-national, a Muslim terrorist, for simply sharing his wife's remark about Islamophobia and bigotry and his ch that his children might face some things like that. Cancel culture is Munawar Faruqi having to spend months in jail for a joke he did not crack. P.S. I was made aware that Munawar also made a Kota joke in the past, but his imprisonment was not for making a Kota joke, but religious and political jokes, which, again, he didn't make. Cancel culture is Tanav Shri Dutta being firstly harassed and then physically attacked being forced to leave the country, her industry, everything behind because she claimed to be harassed by a prominent Bollywood male actor. Just to name a few things. This brings me to the toughest question. Chapter 5. Why is India still casteist? To be honest, there are a million reasons and I would be lying if I claim to be an expert on caste matters. So please learn from books and scholars who have spent their entire lives working on this. But in my meager understanding, for the knowledge of you, my lovely audience, I will talk about three aspects here. First, the philosophical aspect. Second, the historical aspect. And third, the sociological aspect. Let's start philosophy first. Borrowing from American scholar Martin Caste ignorance is similar to what they call white ignorance in America. A white person does not know or is ignorant of what it is like to be black in America. But it's not just about that identity. It is about the ignorance towards racial inequality. For example, only 61% of white Americans agree that blacks are treated less fairly than whites by the criminal justice system, despite evidence suggesting that black Americans are more likely to be stopped, searched, handcuffed, and arrested than white Americans. 
and of course they are more likely to receive harsher sentences for similar crimes. <laughs> and there are million, million such denials that white people have about black racial injustices in America. In a similar way, privileged caste do not see casteism, aka they are ignorant about caste oppression. Jabaz Ansari, who works for The Frame, did such a fantastic video where he went around the streets in Delhi asking people their views on caste. And oh my god, the sheer ignorance reeking in that video. You're not seeing the skill in a person. What do you think? Is Alex Kaskas? Yes, yes. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. But I'm not going to be able to do it. But I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do तब कह रहे दो हजार उन्नीस में छुआछत खत्म हो गया जिसके साथ खत्म हो गया हो गया होगा जिसके साथ नहीं होगा तो खबर करेगा जब किसी ब्राह्मण छत्री का हम सामान लेते हैं तो जो है कि वो पैसा जमीन पर रखवा पर उस पर पानी गिराते हैं कि ये शुद्ध हो जाएगा तो हम बोलते हैं कि सिक्का पर पानी गिराते हो मगर नोट पर क्यों नहीं गिराते अच्छा सवाल है आपका वो काम से बचना चाहते हैं तो जो लोग रिजर्वेशन मांग रहे हैं वो काम नहीं करना चाहते हैं चलिए बिल्कुल भी नहीं वो उस सोसाइटी में नहीं जाना चाहते ना जहाँ वर्क करना पड़े काम कभी उन्होंने किया नहीं है उन्होंने तो मंदिर में घंटा बजाया हमारे को बेकूफ बनाया है उन लोगों को क्या पता बराबरी करने का मेहनत करने का मेहनत तो हमारे लोगों को पूछो ना जो कहते हैं ना पसीने से बदबू आती है एक दिन घटना में उतर के देखिए ब्राह्मण का बेटा जो पुजारी पूजा मंदिर में घंटा बजाता है पंडित कहते हैं की इस देश में केवल शिक्षा प्राप्त करने का अधिकार पंडितों को जो ज्ञान है वो आपने बताया वो ब्राह्मणों का हम लोग का ज्ञान अर्जन और जो है सुधरों को सेवा करना सकता है तो मतलब किसका जो काम है उसको वही करना चाहिए अरे बेवकूफ इंसान तीन से पांच परसेंट तुम्हारी आबादी है अगर मैं शिक्षा तुम्हें प्राप्त करोगे इस देश की साक्षरता केवल पांच परसेंट हुई ना हमारा देश कहाँ जाएगा ऐसे ऐसे दिखाऊंगा आपको एस एस टी वाले दो सौ एफ कार वो कहा से आते जाते हैं ऐसी लोग जो बोलते हैं गरीब तो एक्चुअली अगर उनको देखा जाए ना वो फाइनेंशियल हालत उनकी बहुत स्ट्रॉ होती है फाइनेंशियल हालत अगर स्ट्रॉ भी होगी किसी की तो क्या डिस्क्रिमिनेशन उसके साथ होता है नहीं नहीं ऐसा कुछ नहीं होता क्यों नहीं होता क्यों नहीं होता राष्ट्रपति के साथ हुआ है रामनाथ कोविंद जी गए सीढ़ियों पर बैठा के पूजा करवाई उनके साथ चलो कह रहे थे उनकी वाइफ के पैर में दर्द सीढ़ियों पर नीचे देखो साहब ऐसा है अपनी खाल बचाने के लिए कुछ भी कह सकते हैं आपको भी पता है अभी कुछ दिनों पहले की बात है जब जीतन राम माजी मुख्यमंत्री थे वो एक मंदिर में गए उस मंदिर को भी उन्होंने धोया वो भी दलित है झगड़े होते हैं तो हिंदू बना दिया जाता है नहीं तो मंदिर में नहीं घुसने दिया जाता है बहुत लोग कहते हैं कि आज भी लोगों को मंदिर में नहीं घुसने दिया जा रहा है घोड़ी पे बरात नहीं जा सकती उनकी इन छोटी मोटी घटनाओं को जो भी व्यक्ति प्रमुखता देते हैं उनका निश्चित तौर पर वो भारत विरोधी लोग है वो नहीं चाहते हैं कि भारत आगे बढ़े कोई लोग रिजर्वेशन का पक्ष ले रहे हैं वो लोग भारत विरोधी लोग हैं बिल्कुल पंडित बोलते हैं पंडित मंदिर में नहीं घुसने का तुम्हारा को तो फिर आपने कभी ट्राई किया मंदिर जाने का हम तो जाने छोड़ दिया हमने तो जब बाहर निकाल देते हैं तो फिर कहाँ जाए बताओ क्या बोलते हैं आपको यहाँ बोलते हैं चमारों का मंदिर नहीं है चमारों को नहीं घुसने देंगे हर गांव में क्यों शंकर जी का मंदिर है दुर्गा जी का मंदिर है काली जी का मंदिर है जंगल पहाड़ पर है एक हमारा भगना कैमूर जिला में विजय शंकर फकीर का मंदिर हम कई बार बनाते हैं लेकिन नहीं बनने देता है जो चमार था ब्राह्मण हर चीज को तथ्य के आधार पर ही बोलता है शहर में देखिए छुआ छूट टोटल समाप्त है शहर में तो हम वो छुआ छूट किया है हम लोग आदि हो गए जो बगैर कहे हम लोगों को हम लोगों के साथ की जाती है किसी को हम बताते हैं कि हम वाल्मीकि है तो लोग हमसे बात करने का तरीका बदल देते हैं ऐसा कुछ नहीं होता है आज के टाइम में तो मैं न्यूज भी देखता हूँ ऐसा माहौल नहीं है न्यूज में तो सब अब सही हो गया <laughs> एक ब्राह्मण का यहाँ पर काम करने जाता हूँ मैंने कहा पानी पीना अगर मेरे को पानी की प्यास नहीं थी लेकिन उसी घर वाली पानी लेके आती है गिलास के अंदर वो टूटी का पानी था मैं जानवर भी ऐसा पानी नहीं पीते पंडित जी आप इंसानों के साथ ये काम करते हो आप ये तो दिल्ली एनसीआर की बातें हैं आरक्षण उनको दीजिए जो सक्षम नहीं है जो आर्थिक दृष्टि से गरीब है ये कोई गरीबी उत्थान का कार्यक्रम नहीं है जिन लोगों का सरकार और सरकार के रुतबेदार पोजीशन पर रिप्रेजेंटेशन इन एडिकुएट है उन लोगों को एडिकुएट रिप्रेजेंटेशन देने के लिए आरक्षण आया है ये इक्कीसवीं सदी चल रही है इक्कीसवीं सदी के भारत का निर्माण करना है आज वैसे इक्कीसवीं सदी में छुआछूत होती है नहीं ये छुआछूत मेरे हिसाब से तो कहीं नहीं होती है हाँ छुड़ा तो दंगा हो जाता लड़ाई हो जाती है मतलब आपका हाथ किसी और में टच हो गया टच हो गया तो ट <laughs> But for now, you can see the ignorance of the privileged castes. One might ask, is it that these people really, honestly, genuinely don't know that caste discrimination happens? Or do they willfully want to remain ignorant about it? Because acknowledging caste system would mean admitting privileges. It would mean questioning not just yourself, but your family members, your friends, your spouses, your loved ones, and confronting them. Sounds like a huge commitment, doesn't it? So I better remain
Its other element is called passive ignorance. For example, I don't know much about TikTok. I know it's an app that teenagers use mostly. That is passive ignorance. But active ignorance is when you go out of your way to remain ignorant about something. You have the need to not know. Just like me and ghosts or jinns, for example. I know there are people who have had paranormal experiences and there are shows and all that kind of stuff, but I have deliberately stayed away from these things all my life because I know that if I get into it and watch a lot of it, I might have a cognitive bias and I might start believing more and get suspicious and assume random shit to be happening because of the ghost. If not, I would laugh at it and other people who believe in this and would call me against religion, against, I don't know, nation, society and the complete pointless war would start. So I believe the scientists who have boiled it down to carbon monoxide poisoning happening in and around old buildings and trees that give people hallucinations and out-of-body experiences. So I choose to remain actively ignorant about it. This is what philosophers called doxastic anxiety. I know it's a mouthful, but trust me, it's worth it. It just means anxiety about forming beliefs. I don't want to believe that ghosts exist, so anything suggests that they do, I want to keep myself deliberately ignorant of that. Hi, so my battery ran out and here we are continuing on a new day. So continuing, in some way caste ignorance can be chalked down to this anxiety, the doxic anxiety that I told you, don't you think? See, privileged castes have this doxastic anxiety about believing how bad things are for non-upper castes. So they didn't have to question their family, their friends, and the most important one of all, their religion. In the historical part, I will unravel this doxastic anxiety further. But if you're an Indian, who has gone to a decent private school and who comes from a middle to upper class background, I have a question for you. What do you know about Dr. Ambedkar, other than that he wrote the Constitution of India? Have you ever read any of his books? Do your history books ever talk about Dr. Ambedkar in detail, you know, his scholarly work, his struggles, his theories, be it ICSC, CBSC or any other state board. I mean, I'm not sure about now, but I don't think there are many books on him. Do you see Nehru, Gandhi as the heroes of India's independence along with some side characters? Of course. But do you see Dr. Ambedkar hailed as even half as important as Gandhi. I don't think so. I remember reading books and books and books about Gandhiji credited for abolishing untouchability, how he was granted sainthood and he was called a Mahatma their own words. Why was there nothing anywhere about any single leader from that untouchable so-called group ever? To be specific, I'm talking about Dalits, Bahujans, and Adivasis and other indigenous tribes. Even today, how many leaders, politicians, actors, business tycoons do you know that belong to those castes? Hmm, let me think. This kind of ignorance is not only because we don't want to deliberately know about all this, but also because when they made our textbook, they deliberately built that ignorance into the structure of society, in education, in all fields possible. So we didn't even know that we needed to know about caste or Dr. Maitker's contributions to this great nation that the world calls India and the struggles of the caste oppressed people. This is what philosophers called hermeneutical injustice or 
a kind of censorship, if you will, to keep the masses deliberately ignorant of something so they don't even have the need to know. This is what Dr. Ambedkar was doing. He was liberating the oppressed castes because he was telling them what they needed to know that the caste system and being in servitude of the upper castes isn't one to grant them paradise and all of that was a scam. To keep it all brief, I should now tell you the historical aspect. This is something that completely blew my mind and every single moment I was like, damn. So what happened was in 1937, pre-independence India, obviously, Dr. Ambedkar or Dr. B gets invited to deliver a speech. Now, get ready for this, and I'm not making this up, you can check this up, at the Jat Pat Todak Mandal. Wow, with that grand optimistic title, you would have complete faith in that organization, right? That their whole mission is to break the caste system. If there is any organization in the world that can annihilate caste, it is this heavy titled weight committee of India's top reformers, activists and political leaders. Some of the big names were Sant Ram, Mr. Har Bhagwan and many others like them. So anyway, in 1937, they wrote a letter to Dr. B saying, um, I'm paraphrasing this of course, but hey yo doc, we got this cool event planned, a conference of, co of sorts where us all cool guys in the Shire, you know, we would gather and chill. So why don't you roll through? And oh yeah. We got a lot of crap from a lot of like hardcore Hindu hardliners recently. So it would be good if you gave the speech, you know, or whatever, and you know, brought us all groups together since you got such clout, man. That's so cool. I'm paraphrasing, of course. To which Dr. B had some back and forth about printing his speech for distribution and he was having some health troubles so he wanted to not do it initially but they all insisted so he agreed. After Dr. B agreed, Mr. Santram sends him another letter saying, oh yeah cool but hey why don't you drop a copy for us so we can read it and print it for redistribution. Dr. B obliged and sent his speech over. And here comes the twist, okay? Get ready. Dr. Har Bhagwan responds saying, uh, oh yeah, no, you can't use that word Vedas in the speech. To quote verbatim, his letter said, um, you have unnecessarily attacked the morality and reasonableness of the Vedas and other religious books of the Hindus and have at length dwelt upon the technical side of Hindu religion which has absolutely no connection with the problem at issue. So much so that some of the passages have become irrelevant and off the point. Continuing, he said, The last portion deals with the complete annihilation of the Hindu religion and doubts the morality of the sacred books of the Hindus as well as a hint about your intention to leave the Hindu fold. It does not seem to me to be relevant. He also said that the speech was unnecessarily provocative and pinching. And he said that there are several of us who subscribe to your feelings and would very much want to be under your banner for remodeling the Hindu religion if you had decided to get together persons of your cult. Now, I don't know if the word cult was used derogatorily or not, 
but I can assure you a large number would have joined your army of reformers from the Punjab. And that, my friend, is cancel culture. When the event was literally cancelled because, because Dr. B had a strategy to end caste system that made the privileged committee members uncomfortable. Damn, that was the complete opposite of what you would expect from a committee with such crystal clear name. The Jat Patorak Mandal. Wow, <laughs> they did the polar opposite of that name. Mr. Bhagwan went on to say that the same stuff that we all want to have you on board, but you, and you are of course so amazing, blah blah blah, but just take out the Vedas part, huh? Um, and the Hindu religion annihilation part, and of course that you want to quit being a Hindu. Rest all is excellent and mind-blowing and fantastic and all of those things. What do you think happened after Dr. B got this letter? Do you think he immediately censored his speech and, like a docile, approval-seeking man, sweetened his words so as to not offend the members of the Jat Pat Torak Mandal? Nope, he did the exact opposite. He sent a letter explaining why he wasn't going to change a single word. A single word but also said, and I quote, you are entitled to say that my analysis is wrong, but you cannot say that in an address which deals with the problem of caste, it is not open to me to discuss how caste system can be destroyed. He said that he had taken great pains to explain what he meant by religion and destruction of religion. He said, and I'm sure nobody reading my address could possibly misunderstand me. He further explained that he had no intentions of using the Mandal's platform to advocate his views regarding change of religion by the depressed classes. And by depressed, I mean the word that he used, not me. It's a long letter, but ultimately out our dear Dr. B said that I already clarified that all views are mine and nobody else is responsible for my views. But you know what guys? Whatever. I won't come to your stupid party. Even if you accept the entire speech as it is now because I have run out of patience with you. And, and no honey, I'm not changing who I am or what I believe in to please you and just so you would invite me to your party. I'm out, losers. <laughs> I apologize. I'm just trying to use the Gen Z lingo so our younger generations will care to watch this stuff and take an interest because this is so important. So I apologize for that. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. Please remember. Anyway, later on, Dr. B went on to publish his speech, Annihilation of Caste and distributed copies of it which became a kind of a bible for the depressed classes that he worked for. His speech was interpreted, analyzed by several scholars for years to come and it was made into several books because each person who read that had their own version and interpretation of what they took from that book which is why I highly encourage you to read that speech and find out exactly what was so revolting in that speech and why is it held to be so crucial. The entire point of me telling you this whole fiasco around that speech is what I talked about in the philosophy part, if you remember, the doxastic anxiety. Members of the committee were so frightened by the propositions of Dr. B that they went into this doxastic anxiety as philosopher Jennifer Foster might say. Anxiety about forming beliefs. It wasn't just a political fear of getting heat from Hindu hardliners. Because in case you forgot, you are the Hindu reformists. You call yourself the Jad Pat Torak Mandal. So instead of giving approval to Dr. B or rejecting his very valid claims on the annihilation of caste, they dodged the question entirely. He 
Isn't that convenient? In this way, they could keep being the woke left or the social justice warrior of that era without head-on confronting caste. This is why the caste system has not ended yet. All of this is deeply complex history and I urge you to please read more because I have largely simplified all of this in order to pack it neatly in one video so that people would invest some time in watching and get interested in this. But the committee might have done other great things and I know they have. I know they had Motilal Nehru and many other great leaders of that time presiding over and doing some really great work. But when it came to caste, they all became like the rich kid club where you gather and use fancy hashtags and do some fundraising and stuff and do some Twitter shit and claiming on Insta to help a marginalized community. But when an actual person of that committee comes up to tell you what they want and how you can open the party to all kids and let them all have a share of the wealth pie, then all of a sudden, you're out. Now very briefly, let me touch on the sociological part of the caste discrimination. What is life like for a Dalit person? And why did these caste-based mocking bring out such outrage among Twitterati's? According to the National Crime Records Bureau, a crime is committed against a Dalit by a non-Dalit every 16 minutes. Every day, more than four untouchable women are raped by touchables. Every week, 13 Dalits are murdered and six Dalits are kidnapped. In 2012 alone, the year when Nirbhaya rape and murder took place, 1,574 Dalit women were raped. The rule of thumb is that only 10% of rapes or other crimes against Dalits are ever recorded even. So you can imagine the number and 651 Dalits were murdered. And that's just the rape and butchery. Not the stripping and parading naked, the forced shit eating, the seizing of their lands, the social boycotts, the restriction to access to drinking water, etc. In September 2020, a 19-year-old Dalit woman was gang raped by four upper caste men in Hathras village of Uttar Pradesh. She was taken to the police station to file a complaint which the police took hours to file while she was just lying on the concrete floor, injured. Despite her testimony, there was tampering of all sorts with the evidence until she was finally provided treatment and help. But in two weeks time, she succumbed to her injuries. If this wasn't brutal enough, the street cremated her body in the middle of the night in the absence of her family because some decent journalist had gotten hold of the story and the pathetic, lethargic failure in state in handling her medical and legal case. The night, only police and distant family members were present. Her father, her mother, her brothers. Today we say it again. This time as a young woman from Uttar Pradesh was once again gang raped, police apathy and negligence of a system led to a death yesterday and then worse was to come. A cremation in the middle of the night, only Police and distant family members were present. Her father, her mother, her brothers locked up. The cremation took place despite traditional, which is that you can't carry out funerals at the middle of the night and without the family's permission. We also learned the district magistrate is also coming to handle the situation here. Now, you see uh, there are fields all around this area and in the middle of that, there is one road where locals and villagers have stopped this vehicle, halted it, and they allege the police was going to take the body for funeral. Uh, uh, cops have formed a human chain and uh, the funeral is taking place at 2.30 a.m. This is after altercation broke between cops and villagers. Inside the house, the state was opened few hours back. Now locked relatives inside. Uh, 
आप में से कोई भी एंड इट्स रिपोर्टर्स लाइक अरुण एंड सो मेनी अदर यंग रिपोर्टर्स हु वर देयर थ्रू द नाइट हु एक्चुअली ब्रॉट द ट्रूथ आउट ऑफ हाउ द बॉडी वाज क्रिमेटेड ऑफ दिस यंग वुमन विदाउट द फैमिलीज परमिशन जस्ट लुक एट दिस विजुअल्स द फैमिली लॉक्ड अप इन देयर होम टू प्रिवेंट देम फ्रॉम गोइंग टू देयर डॉटर्स फ्यूनरल अरुण वाज आल्सो देयर टू रिकॉर्ड दिस कन्वर्सेशन बिटवीन द डिस्ट्रिक्ट मैजिस्ट्रेट एंड द फादर एट नाइट व्हेन द फादर इज प्लीडिंग लेट मी ब्रिंग माय डॉटर्स बॉडी होम लेट देम सी हर एंड द डीएम टेल्स हिम दैट यू कैन सी द बॉडी एनीवे जस्ट लुक एट द वे दैट द डिस्ट्रिक्ट मैजिस्ट्रेट टॉक्स टू दिस फैमिली फ्रॉम अ शेड्यूल कास्ट थोड़ी सी घर मट्टी जरूर लगेगी सर आप बीच में लगेंगे कोई कोई दिक्कत नहीं होगी देखो घर ले जाओगे तो भी देखो कि वहाँ भी हम आपको दिखाएंगे घर में आपसे मैं बात ही नहीं कर रहा आप कौन है क्या बोल रहा है लोग बात वो करो जो सुन लिया गया बहुत ज्यादा जो ये बता रहे हैं इनको सुना जा रहा पिता जी को इनको भाई भी खड़ा पीछे सबसे बात हो सकती है क्या हर आदमी वो बन रहा है जो नेता बन रहे हैं सब लोग हर फैमिली कुड नॉट से गुड बाय टू दिस डॉटर ऑफ इंडिया बर्न टू एशेज टू हाइड अवे द फेलियर ऑफ द स्टेट अलॉट ऑफ स्टफ है बट जस्टिस इज नो वेर टू बी सीन एंड दिस काइंड ऑफ अट्रोसिटी कैन नेवर एवर ever happen with an upper caste upper class family so this is what life is like for dalit families and yet erasure of caste system or caste supremacy is not even on the list of priorities for the woke social justice warriors of india as roy said today in current debates on identity and justice for the best known indian scholars caste is at best a topic a subheading or a footnote but that's it roy says this erasure of this project of unseeing is sometimes a conscious political act and sometimes comes from a place of such rarefied privilege that caste has not been stumbled upon them yet even in the dark and therefore it is presumed to have been eradicated like smallpox this is the ignorance i was talking about in the philosophy section this pretense that the caste system does not exist by the privileged castes best to remain ignorant instead of owning anything remotely close to it caste is based on a hierarchical sliding scale of entitlements and duties or the concept of purity and pollution so the top caste pyramid is considered pure and has plenty of entitlement the bottom is considered polluted and has no entitlements but plenty of duties what we call the caste system today is known in hinduism's founding text as chaturvarna the system of four varnas Of course there are plenty of castes but they can be categorized categorized into four occupations the top jati is of brahmins or the priests or the intellectuals now in modern educated society then come the kshatriyas or the soldiers third come the vaishyas or traders banias people who do businesses and then shudras or servants outside these varnas are ati shudras which are called avarnas arranged further in hierarchies of the untouchables and the unseeables and the unapproachables whose shadow even is considered dirty and polluting disclaimer i'm sharing this because based on the ignorance of these tweets i doubt if many people even know this part of course when caste is such a tight knit circle inter caste marriages would not be allowed i can't even bother to search out how many incidents or news articles of these uh, couples who are shot or burned to death because they loved and married a person of a different caste because that's how common everyday news it is Yet an interesting thing is that the men of the privileged caste had undisputed rights over the bodies of untouchable women. <laughs> Love is polluting, but rape 
is pure. So, in other words, if a man of an upper caste wants to marry a non-upper caste, he can't because, you know, she's impure. But raping women is perfectly great? Yikes. Well, most of us believe in this philosophy of karma, right? That if we do bad, we will be punished in some way. This caste theory suggests that those born into subordinated caste are supposedly being punished for the bad deeds they have done in their past lives. So it's like they are living a prison sentence. But the upper caste will say, listen up you untouchables, if you behave in this life, you might have an extended sentence, so in your next life, you could be born as a Shudra. Isn't that much better? <sighs> Dr. B said there cannot be a more degrading system of social organization than the caste system. It is the system that deadens, paralyzes, and cripples the people from helpful activity. As you might have noticed in these Costas tweets, a lot of them had a, uh, how shall I put this, um, quota boner, as Hasan Minaj puts it. He says that a lot of these privileged people are mocking the affirmative action or the quota system, and of course they are the believers in merit. I mean, of course. Although I'm making a full-length video on the topic of merit because that's how much attention it deserves, um, here is something to consider for those who might be thinking about Dalits taking undue advantage of the reservations. According to the government data, 71.3% of scheduled caste students drop out before they matriculate which means that even for the low-end government jobs, the reservation policy only applies to one in four Dalits. <laughs> in 1931, when Dr. B met Gandhi for the first time, as expected, Gandhi questioned him about his sharp, criticism of the Congress, which Gandhiji translated to criticism of the homeland for some reason. But to that, Dr. B said, Gandhi, I have no homeland. No untouchable worth the name will be proud of this land. And this sentiment is not unique to Dr. B. In 1847, Frederick Douglass, the American abolitionist and social reformer said, I have no love for America as such. I have no patriotism. I have no country. What country have I? The institutions of this country do not know me, do not recognize me as a man. So if caste is bad, why do so many people ascribe to it? Why can't it be like a sucky YouTube channel? You just click on subscribe, get rid of the notification bell and voila you're now a free human being why can't people just get rid of their surname and burn all those rules there is a huge reason and please make an effort to understand this it's really simple dr b said that caste is a system of graded inequality so there is no such thing as a completely underprivileged class except for the one which is at the very base of the social pyramid. The privileges of the rest, which means everybody in the middle and the top one of course, are graded. Even the low is privileged compl compared to the lower. You get what I mean? So each class is being privileged and every class is interested in maintaining the system so they have some people under them to rule over, if that makes any sense. So in that way, Brahminism is practiced not just by a Brahmin person, but everyone. It means there is a quotient of Brahminism in everybody, 
regardless of the caste they belong to because they are interested in maintaining that system. Brahmanism makes it impossible to draw a clear line between victims and oppressors. When incidents like Rohit Vimala or Payal Tarvi happened, we people in the privileged caste get shocked and maybe tweet or post about it a few times max and that's it. So we do watch and witness casteism but then do nothing about it or hardly anything. So, so even the passive doesn't really honestly apply for the adults in this day and age. On one hand, you have these casteist jokes and on the other hand, a real people like Payal Tarvi, Dr. Payal Tarvi and Rohit Vemula. Why is it so difficult to connect the dots between those casteist jokes and the lives lost? Why can't we see that these so-called jokes are enjoyed by these casteist people and then repeated by others in professional and social life which then lead to the brutal heartbreaking cases like Dr. Tarvi and Rohit Vemula. So no, these are not just bad jokes made on Amazon Prime and to be laughed at and forgotten. These bad jokes have real life impact on a lot of people. And it's truly shitty of you to think that this is no big deal. So is the state of the Indian society. This is how we have been programmed to operate because that caste hierarchy has been so deeply ingrained in us all that we don't even realize that these are not just words, bad jokes or politically incorrect phrases. Chapter 6 Final Thoughts the rest of the video has been based on solid concepts from various fields but in this final section I want to take a good hard look at everything and say what I felt while watching this Neville fiasco unfold. As an opinionated Muslim woman I already receive a shit ton of crap from Islamophobic as well as Muslim men online. Most of it, I ignore. Doing a video about caste slash Romanism and all this was certainly a challenge because the moment people would see my name, they would accuse me of attacking Hinduism. I know this very well, but to that, I want to be honest and say that Muslims in theory have no casteism through Islam, yes, but South Asian Muslims very heavily practice caste. So in no way I am excusing Muslims from the blame of perpetrating caste system. But I can understand how the Manusmriti had the Chatur Varnas and the Vedas, the scriptures that outright classified humans into those four categories going and actually going against caste system would mean standing in direct opposition to those scriptures. Hence, people completely dodge the matter of caste. However, it would be ignorant to say Sikhs, Muslims and Christians living in India also align strictly with the caste system. My knowledge, however, of the Muslim caste system is limited, which is why I want to do a separate video about this in the future. But I didn't say much in this one because out of my whole life I've lived the majority in India, some in Saudi Arabia and now in the UK. So away from the everyday experience of an Indian citizen, my experience and knowledge about caste are limited. However, even when the time I was in India, I, one, did not think that reservation was bad in any way, two, did not believe in arranged marriages like ever, three, did not think I was superior to anyone. This is not to say that I might never ever have made any casteist statements or done any casteist things at all. 
I was born and raised in that system. And to claim that the system did not program me to maintain that very system would be a huge why. Acknowledging that we are ignorant is the following in the footsteps of the world's once wisest man, Plato, who said, I know that I know nothing. Because unless we acknowledge the problem, we would never be able to do anything about it. I am sharing my personal thoughts because all of these tweets, clips, and Neville Charles casteism wrapped as comedy. They made me question my own privileges and ignorance and caste. And I'm not trying to make take the space from the marginalized people who directly experience casteism. Instead, I've coded them in the video point by point because I learned a lot of this from them. So I, so I urge you to please follow these people to enhance your knowledge and understanding of caste issues. But as an intersectional feminist, if my understanding of social justice doesn't include caste, I don't think I can claim to be a feminist. As I mentioned in the philosophy section, there is active ignorance and there is passive ignorance. I was passively ignorant about caste when I was about 18 because I was in that tight bubble of being around people who were mostly the same caste or class as I was. Add to it your books, your overall education system, ICSC board that did not say much about caste system anyway or how crucial the issue really is. So I was passively ignorant because I had no access to the awareness around caste. However, the advent of the internet age changed a lot of these things. I see on Twitter young minds discussing caste politics and all kinds of discussion on Twitter and Facebook memes and pages and it blows my mind to learn all of that. In this day and age, there is no excuse for passive ignorance because you come across so many things on your own social media that the only way you would be ignorant about caste issues is when you are choosing to be actively ignorant about it. I got to learn who Dr. B, our hero Ambedkar, really was when I was doing research for an academic chapter writing about meritocracy and marriages. Everything I read was screaming at my ignorance and since then I made it a point to actively learn instead of being actively ignorant about caste issues. I am a novice and there are a lot more people way more knowledgeable than I am and have a lot more to say and you can learn from them. Yet I made this video with the teeny tiny understanding of caste that I have because if caste-based discrimination is so normal, why shouldn't the knowledge of that discrimination be normal too? Time factor is an important thing in caste discourse. We can all almost undoubtedly agree that in our younger years, we were less aware of these issues, caste issues, with the exception, of course, of the marginalized people. And as we grow older and got exposure to diverse people and environments and read books out of syllabus and interacted with people outside of our tiny bubbles, we made an effort to unlearn our sexism, our racism, casteism, and a bunch of other isms. Hopefully. <laughs> For example, famous movie maker Anurag Kashyap revealed that when he was younger, he was vehemently against reservations. As he got matured and understood the ways caste discrimination affects the marginalized groups, he changed his views. And now he considers himself a reformed man who unlearned his casteism. Personal growth. This begs the ultimate question Should we forgive people? who once in their young naive age believed in bigotry and said and did bigoted stuff, but are now taking accountability and enthusiastically doing better? Not being called out and publicly shamed first, of course. Or is that forgiveness undeserved? I'm not the best judge to decide because I don't think I'm someone personally affected by casteism, but as a Muslim woman, I would forgive someone who said bigoted Islamophobic stuff when they were younger. Would I? Hard to say. Hard to say because the context matters. What was said, how bad was it, and the people who were affected by it. A lot of privileged people like Dhruv Rati were quick to jump on the alarmist wagon of this, oh, this is cancel culture coming for us and it shouldn't matter what someone said 10 years ago, blah, blah, blah. I certainly don't think that's fair to say because if a celebrity or a famous person in position of power said a casteist or sexist thing even 10 years ago and now with the advent of smartphones and access to social media, we got to know about it. We at least deserve to know if 
One, that person still believes in that bigoted thing. Two, he is ready to now take accountability for their action. And three, acknowledge their part in contributing to discrimination and making things hard for marginalized people. And if they're genuinely illustrating what growth have they had and why should their fans or the general public believe in them? With their newfound wisdom of cost awareness, what steps, if any, have they taken to eradicate casteism? I mean, that's the bare minimum, right? Celebrities, influencers, people in positions of power. When you have social or financial capital, you are ever more responsible for the words that come out of your mouth or on your tweets. You cannot, in a million years, excuse your casteism as passive ignorance. No, you are either a casteist bigot or you're hiding behind your active ignorance, which also translates to casteist bigotry. Please educate yourself on casteism. Read Dr. B's books. Follow content creators from Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi communities. Help out organizations and activists financially or socially. Stand for justice. And most importantly, never, ever, ever say it was just a joke. Woke. Don't be so woke. And never, ever say, if I hurt anyone's sentiments, you know jolly well you did. And there are people telling you that you did. There is no if. Own your privilege without hiding behind your mom's death. A lot of people have lost loved ones and yes, everyone has their own way of grieving. But if your way of grieving requires you to make ableist and casteist attacks on groups of marginalized people, try again. I want to end the video by showing you an idiotic rendition of an upper caste woman looking at casteism in India. to quickly add that on Twitter all of this happened there were a lot of people on Twitter who are actual activists who are working for these causes and who corrected Neville and pointed out all of this and always there is a very small but yet there is a group of people who will take it too forward and who would do things like harass somebody or uh, send rape and death threats and things like that so even if you're doing it for a good cause even if you know some celebrity was casteist or sexist or whatever and you are saying all of these things to them because you think that you are on the right thing you see if you really want to genuinely want to end casteism the way you would do it is not by sending death threats to a celebrity or to a stand-up comedian because guess what he has only so much power. If you really genuinely want to end casteism or talk about social justice issues, then question your politicians. Use your vote to uplift people who need them. Vote leaders who belong to these communities so that they can come forward and uplift not just their own communities, but when they uplift their communities, they uplift the entire nation. So just cancelling a particular stand-up guy is not the solution to casteism if you really want a solution to casteism then genuinely work for it don't just uh, send some tweets and think that your job here is done oh i am not a bigot anymore no 
this is slacktivism this is not activism if you are a real activist or if you are just a citizen who is actively concerned about these issues then as i said donate to these causes go stand in the riots talk to these people um, befriend and marry into marginalized communities so that the caste discrimination is not there anymore Doing things like this is going to end casteism. Read, if you're not even going to talk to somebody or uh, mingle with a person of another caste, fine, just do it for yourself. Acknowledge your own self, your own privileges, and read books in your own time. Make yourself more aware of how the world works, how things are, how other people's lives are affected by casteism. And if you cannot even do that, then sending a few tweets on Twitter or sending death threats or doing stuff like that, it's not going to change casteism. It's not going to change anything. But except for it might make you feel good for a few moments and it might boost your ego that, oh yeah, I'm such a great activist and revolutionary who's doing so much. But in the real world, I'm sorry, it's not going to do much. So... If you really want to end casteism or if you, I don't think um, it's realistically even possible in our lifetimes to completely annihilate caste because that since 1931 Dr. B had been trying to do that so we all know that social changes to work at a glacial speed and they take a lot of time but they're going to take even longer time if you and I don't talk and address these issues even now in 2021 when there's a robot on Mars that is sending pictures uh, we here are talking about why one person should not be superior to another just imagine where we are as a society where we are as a country and at this point I'll end my video. I'll see you soon in the next one. Bye-bye.